recording episode 179 of the Cricket Her Weekly and Sid we have just watched the final of this year's women's handling competition and it was a Southern Brave triumph by 34 runs I think it was in the end against the Northern Superchargers. Um, now we were both talking before the final about who we thought was going to triumph um, and we predicted Brave um, so Sid why did you think Brave would win and why did you think they did win? Um, well, I suppose that, you know, there's, there's a reason why they've topped the table, you know, again, they've topped the table in two of the, the three seasons, um, and they just seem to have, you know, a bit more depth to their team, and I think that we did kind of see that today, because, you know, both teams lost lost early wickets, they lost two early wickets, very similar circumstance, um, but, you know, Brave still had Danny Wyatt there, who was able to kind of, uh, she had to take on a little bit of a different role um, in, in terms of the fact that she had to kind of retrench her game just a little bit. She couldn't go out a million miles an hour suddenly because she needs to be a little bit careful and she obviously knew that. But then, you know, after the sort of 50 ball mark, she really opened up and, you know, she was on set, set for an even bigger score in, in it on one of the most unlucky dismissals that you're going to see because you know not only did it hit her and ricochet off but it kind of went pretty much straight to Kate Cross who just was like thanks very much I'll, I'll take that as a wicket. Um, I almost felt in some other circumstances that the captain might have recalled the um, you know recalled the appeal for that wicket because it was almost felt a little bit unfair it was so unlucky but obviously you know this is a, a big game and they weren't going to do that and that that's fine absolutely you know no no opinion from me that that's what should have happened um but yeah so you know and they powered through it and then you know the such a key player in the in this final for me was Rihanna Southby and I, I've just written a piece which you can read on the site about her performance in this match and about how you know this has just been like a dream month for her and it's capped that dream month and bearing in mind that you know a month ago she was the player that got dropped for the entirety of the Charlotte Edwards Cup she didn't play any games in the Charlotte Edwards Cup she'd been dropped because her batting wasn't good enough and she was she, you know she was kind of out of favour and then suddenly you know she's back into the into the, the effectively the same team, um, you know, the, the Brave Rod and the Vipers. She's back here, uh, she's she's playing in these matches and she's here at Lords and she's lifted the trophy off taking, you know, three good stumpings and having a, a, you know, another great game and what, what, a, what a month she's had. You know, we talk about Anya Shrubsoul's kind of, you know, dream send off and, you know, it definitely was, you know, <laughs> She's won the game in you know her last ever professional cricket game. You know she's walked off with you know the big, or literally the biggest. <laughs> <laughs> it must be the biggest trophy in the game. Uh, it's enormous. Um, uh, but you know what's Rihanna Southby? You know what it must it be like to be her after having the, the low that she had at the beginning of the summer of being dropped, and now you know everyone's talking about her as the you know the, the best keeper you know if, of the young people in England. Great. Um, yeah, absolutely agree with everything you just said. Um, I would add that for me, I think the key factor today, um, and you know, there is a reason why we keep getting um, Southern Brave in the final, is it is um, it's the Charlotte Edwards effect, and it's also the fact that this is a team that she's gathered around her, who are very loyal to her, and who play very well together. And as you said, it is effectively the same team as the Vipers. Um, I actually asked, we had Lauren Bell in the press conference, I actually asked her about this, and she said, yeah, it really helps because we play together all the time. Um, she did also talk about there having been some different personalities around the group during the 100. It's not 100% the same people, but it feels very similar. It feels like a very similar ethos of Charlotte Edwards, you know, being very much in charge and very much inspiring loyalty. Um, and she's just added the one remaining trophy to her cabinet that she did not yet have. Um, so, you know, fantastic for her. Um, and as you say, um, it was great for Anna Trubsoll. A little bit disappointing that she didn't get to bowl her, her oh, final we were five balls. She'd bowl that final set, weren't we? Yeah. And you would take that last wicket. That would have been the, the absolute, yeah. that would have been the, the headline writer's dream. Yeah. I mean, but. Lauren Bell should really have just not removed those bales for that, that <laughs> final run out. Um, of course, that's not how cricket works. And uh, she would have looked a bit silly if they'd then gone and smashed like six sixes or whatever. Um, but yeah, could have been could have been quite funny. Um, so maybe not like 100% the fairy tale ending for Shop Soul. She didn't take, she, she took one wicket but it was you know probably like 99 percent of the fairy tale yeah. yeah i think she did that she she kept on the tradition didn't she of not lifting the trophy herself she gave it to one of the other players i think waggy in the end oh, lifted okay. the trophy i believe okay. so you know that's another thing that we've we've kept going with so right. yeah but what so i want to talk a bit more about the what brave have done there um because it, it one thing that i thought was really interesting is that you know it's mostly the their domestic players that have won this tournament through mm. through you know through all, all of their, their hard work. 
and you know all of the improvements we've seen in the domestic game. And in fact, this hasn't been all about the overseas players because, in fact, if you look at the, the numbers, Brave have carried two of their overseas yeah. players, um, Chloe Tryon and Maitland Brown. Um, you know, their contribute between them, their contributions have been pretty negligible. You know, um, you know, and you know, I don't want to knock particularly on Maitland Brown because you know she's a player that's still you know coming to coming. You know, she's she's still her peak is still to come. Um, but Chloe Tryon a bit has been a little bit disappointing, I think. You know, she was kind of hired to play that sort of aggressive power hitting role, mm -hmm. the role that we've seen Laura Harris uh, play a couple of times for for the Welsh Fire, and she just hasn't well. Uh, Chloe Tryon hasn't fired. She's bowled a bit. She's 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 you know she's done a job, you know, and she's done the done things in the field, you know, and she's run around gamely. But she hasn't produced that. I think she's got two double figure scores and the highest of twenty something. Mm -hmm. So she, she hasn't really justified her her price tag. Maitland Brown's also you know she hasn't had a lot of opportunities, but she hasn't scored a lot of runs. Um, she ha she hasn't bowled much. She's only bowled a couple of times, and she's supposed to be primarily a bowler, really, is she not? Um, so you know, and yet. Even though they've been carrying those two players, Brave have powered through and won it. Well, yeah, I think partly um, those two players who you've just talked about haven't had an awful lot to do because um, Spriti Mandana, their other overseas, Danny Wyatt and Maya Boucher have been so dominant with the bat. Also, um, some really important contributions with with Freya Kemp. Um, so, sorry, from Freya Kemp. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's been it's been a team who play well together in domestic cricket um, and aren't, aren't the kind of big name overseas superstars largely speaking so fantastic for them to have won it um, shall we reflect a little bit on what happened yesterday at the Oval Seeds which was the uh, the eliminator was eliminated by the weather <laughs> thank you thank you for laughing at my terrible joke um, the, you know, the, we had 75 balls bowled of it. Um, it had already been reduced to 95 balls, but then it was totally washed out by a thunderstorm. I had to initially abandon play for safety reasons because there was lightning and then there was more rain. But following that, there was then beautiful sunshine for multiple hours. And of course, the entirety of the men's eliminator did get played with no reduction in available balls. And there were some very, very frustrated, unhappy Welsh Fire players and, and supporters, you'd, you'd have to think. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about perhaps what we should do about this. Is it, is it fair um, that, that that is what transpired when actually you perhaps could have had time to fit in two shorter games? Now, we've talked about this a couple of weeks ago, actually, on the podcast. Um, and I thought we had reached a stage whereby they were prepared to shorten the men's game in order to get the women, a bit more of the women's game played because we did have an example where the, where the men's game was delayed by I think it was 15 minutes or half an hour um, because the women's game overran. Um, and we have been hearing, in fact it was, it was said on the radio today I believe, that um, the plan for today, had it rained and there was the forecast of some rain, um, although it hasn't actually transpired, but had it rained, um, there was a plan to foreshorten the men's game in order to get in um, something that constituted a game in the women's game. So do you think that's, that's the right, that would have been the right way to handle it, Sid, to, to make that last minute change between yesterday and today? Well, at the end of the day, you know, what happened yesterday is that, you know, there was enough time to play 275 balls of cricket. And, you know, the way that things transpired is that they played 75 balls of a women's game, which couldn't constitute a game, and 200 balls of the men's game. So there obviously was time to get to get both games played. Um, you know, I, I, I do understand the ECB's you know, perspective overall, that, you know, you need some sort of certainty and surety. And the TV people, you know, TV is king in particular, um, you know, Sky is king, um, and you know they they've sold adverts around a particular schedule, um, so you can't just like completely upend things. Um, but on the other hand, you know, well, it does seem like what we're hearing here today is that they have said, well, we can't completely upend things, but we could have completely upended things if we'd wanted to. So you know, they obviously they they can make that flexibility happen if they really want to, and I think that that's what ideally I think we'd like to see in the future for this competition in particular because you know this is a very special kind of double header it is a very much a double header where both games are supposed to matter equally so I think that there's no reason why you couldn't have gone you know at the point where the players were in a position to be able to potentially come back on at which point the game had already been called off but the, the, the women could have come back on and you could have at that point said oh well you know we're going to take 
uh, you know, 20 balls off the three remaining innings that there are, um, rather than just losing the entirety mm. of the rest of the women's game mm. and you know the men's game completing with all 100 balls. I think, yeah, the issue is um, that the ECB are um, kind of promoting it as one match day. Um, and that is, as you say, the kind of unique thing about it compared with other double headers. So they're promoting it and they're saying kind of philosophically it's one match day um, and both matches are equally important. And it's almost like it's the same, it's the, it's the same match. But actually, in practice, the frustration is coming from the fact that the, the two games are not being treated equally. Um, and that they are treating them as if they are totally separate games in the traditional sense of a double header, right? And so you've got a mismatch between the kind of the theory or the philosophy surrounding the hundred and surrounding the match days and what's actually happening in practice. And that's why people are getting frustrated and upset because um, what they're hearing does not match what's happening in practice. Um, yeah, I suppose and, the issue sorry. with making last minute changes is that you ha maybe haven't thought through all of the ramifications of those, right? Um, and actually, you know, when you do make sudden last minute changes with no thought, then sometimes you don't, um, you don't kind of think through all of the scenarios. And a good example actually happened in the first year of the Women's 100, um, when they um, had that thing in the rain regulations that said that if no balls of the men's game gets played, even if the women's game has been played, then all ticket holders get a 100% refund. And there was an outcry about that because people were going, hang on a minute, this is really not in keeping with what you're saying about your ethos of the competition, of both of them being equal. And they realised that and they changed the regs halfway through. But somebody had just clearly copied and pasted those rain regs from somewhere else and just go, yeah, we'll just use those for the 100. So if you do things without thought and without going, right, what are all the scenarios? How could it play out? This is how it played out on Saturday at the Oval in the Eliminator. But tomorrow at Lords, it could play out totally differently. Um, next season, we could have 20 other different scenarios with rain. Then who knows? And so you do really have to, I think, make changes having thought through all of the implications. Yeah, and I think of something else that would be important going forward as well, which hasn't been the uh, the case here is that you know they need to let everybody know what's what's going mm. on um, and that's something they didn't really do here so you know what what we've found out today seems to have mostly come because Alex Hartley got some inside information yeah. there, <laughs> um, that she then kind of talked about on on the radio and then everyone else was like oh okay now we now we know this do we yeah so th there's not always the clarity from the ECB about exactly what what would happen under these circumstances um, and you know it's a little bit like the the Charlotte Edwards Cup final when no one was sure that there was a reserve day and you know even as the rain was coming down at, during the Charlotte Edwards Cup day at the final we were all going there's a reserve day and some people going yeah there's a reserve day and other people were going I don't think there is a reserve day yeah and so yeah. you know it, it, it's helpful if everybody actually knows what's going on um, and the big problem with rain and legislating for rain is that you're having to make a guess based on the weather forecast aren't you so we could have looked at the weather forecast for yesterday afternoon and gone oh well it says there's going to be storms and loads of rain so let's reduce the women's game initially to 25 balls a side and then that will constitute a game and they would have got that in easily and then the rain would have come down and you know whoever won would have felt right we're actually justified in getting through to the final but if they'd done that and then there hadn't been any rain and the whole thing had just played out then there would have been loads of spectators sitting around for three hours in the middle between the games going hang on a minute why aren't we watching any cricket at the moment yeah absolutely i think it also bears stating um does it not that at the end of the day you know Okay, we, we, we accept and we can see that the Welsh Fire have made a decent total and, you know, it probably feels like they probably would have gone on to win that match because it was a decent total to have made in 75 balls. Um, but at the end of the day, what happened was basically fair. Um, because you know, four days previously, Superchargers had beaten the Fire in the group stage game and that was what ultimately decided. Yeah, the, because the ultimately finalists. it turns out there is a reward for coming second. Yeah. The reward for coming second is that... I think some, Something dead exciting must have just happened in the men's game behind us, because there's a huge, a huge cheer. Um, no idea what that is. Um, uh, 
anyway, so going back to, to the Welsh Fire, that yes, they would have won that game, but, but ultimately, if they hadn't lost the game earlier in the week, then it would have all been a different story. And so, that's exactly what Danny Hazel said in the post-match press conference, because I asked her, I said, how much do you feel that what happened yesterday in the Eliminator actually made a difference coming into today's game? Because there was a lot of people saying that Superchargers didn't really deserve to be here. And she said, you know, it's Mother Nature. She said it in a Geordie accent, which I'm not going to attempt. Um, but you know, um, it, you know, why I mate? It's Mother Nature. That was terrible. Um, and and Cricket her would like to apologise <laughs> to Danny Hazel and anybody else from Newcastle. But, but basically, um, yeah, she said we deserved it because we won against Welsh Fire four days ago. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, you know, there were there are the rules, and you know, Welsh Fire had every opportunity to have won that other game. They didn't win it. Say la vie. I mean, um, Welsh Fire's prize, even if they had got through, were probably to have been beaten by Brave. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, away from the hundreds, um, metaphorically speaking, because we, literally speaking, we are not very far away from the hundred, as you've just heard. <laughs> but, but metaphorically speaking, away from the hundred in terms of news, there's been some very big news coming out of South Africa this week. Um, now, the, the slightly less exciting bit of news is the announcement of equal match fees, which is the thing that's made the headline, equal match fees for the women in comparison to the men. Now, we've spoken at length before on the broadcast, Sid, about how that's basically just a headline-inducing um, piece of news that doesn't really mean very much in practice because most of the pay comes from the salary. So we won't reiterate that too much. But anyway, they're getting equal match fees. But the really exciting thing is that they're setting up a domestic professional structure. And it's the first sport in South Africa that's going to have a domestic professional structure. Sorry, first women's sport that's going to have this domestic professional structure. So really exciting, um, really important thing to happen across the board for women's sport in South Africa, first of all. So just a few details, there's going to be six professional teams with 11 contracts at each team. Um, they're also going to have full-time coaching staffs um, and Cricket South Africa is going to um, subsidise four backroom staff positions for each of the six sides and they're going to actually require two of them to be female. Yeah, so there's, there, that is some really interesting stuff from South Africa. Mm. I think it's a really interesting pr approach that they've taken as well to how they're setting up these teams. So what we saw in this country is that the ECB decided to kind of abandon the counties um, because you know they didn't want to particularly favour one county over another. So they said, well, what we're going to do is amalgamate the counties and we're going to create these regions. Mm. Um, and you know that's how we see things playing out. South Africa have taken completely the opposite approach. So what what they're saying is that there's going to be, uh, is it five or six? Six. six? six of these kind of top uh, teams, but they're just going to pick the six top teams from their current provincial system, uh, and those teams will be the six teams in the first season, but there will also be a degree of promotion and relegation. So the implication there is that what's going to happen is that after you know the first season has played out, one of those teams at least will lose their status mm -hmm. as one of the top teams, and a new team can therefore come in. And this is something that we discussed whether or not this could possibly happen in England. And we kind of everyone concluded, well, we don't really want to do this because you know, there's, it means it's difficult to invest long term if you're not certain you're going to be receiving that income in the next year. Well, South Africa have taken the opposite approach. Um, and you know it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out and how it plays out for those teams as they you know as they lose funding after that first year. And the other thing that's really interesting about um, about this is is the thing that I just read out about the fact that they are actually mandating that some of these new professional staff at these women's um, these professional women's domestic teams are going to have to be women, and that's obviously something that we haven't seen in England um, and we're still seeing an absolute um, kind of absence of um, coaches from many of the regional teams um, who are women and there, there is still an um, absence of this pathway. So obviously South Africa um, are very accustomed to the use of quotas because there are a lot of racial quotas for very obvious reasons. Um, so it's, it's very interesting to see that they're also decided well we've got we're going to adopt some gender quotas. 
Um, now there are lots of academic debates about the extent to which gender quotas actually work, um, but it's, it's potentially um, a very interesting development in the sense of let's see, let's see if it works, let's see whether um, South Africa can um, kind of promote better and um, better and more pathways for women coaches um, and actually there was a really irritating conversation on Sky I will say before the Eliminator yesterday um, just when the rain was coming down and there was a delay initially um, and it was Nasser Hussain and Nick Knight um, and Nasser Hussain said one of the things we need to do to try and catch up with Australia um, is to have more women coaches and that's really important and Nick Knight basically said oh so you're saying that women coaches should be promoted above their station and Nasser Hussain was said, said basically, no, I'm not saying that, of course I'm not saying that, but it was an incredibly infuriating conversation because the amount of male coaches who get jobs, who have no experience, who just get, who just get the gig because their old mate rings them up and says, oh, why don't you come along and, and help, me, help me out here? do a bit of coaching with this women's team and so then they get the experience they get the job and they become a coach and there are loads of women who don't get those opportunities who have all of the coaching qualifications but none of the connections and it really still feels like in this country very much a jobs for the boys um, ethos prevails and that conversation on Sky will have done absolutely nothing to dissipate that because anyone who watched it will have been like oh yeah yeah Nick Knight's obviously saying that you know there are there are women coaches who don't deserve their jobs and it's like mate it's actually the other way around there are a load of bloke coaches out there who don't deserve their jobs anyway I've gone off the point slightly since but well, and also <laughs> look at the two coaches here today Absolutely. Just follow the piece for the Guardian that reflects on those two, uh, you know, that amazing, um, exciting, ongoing rivalry that we've got between those two coaches. Did actually ask Danny Hazel about that as well in the post-match press conference. I won't attempt to do the Geordie accent for a second time, um, but you know, she said, "Yeah." You compared um, them in your Guardian piece to, to, to Alex Ferguson and Arsene Wenger and their great rivalry in men's football. But I want to know which one's which, right? <laughs> which one's, you know, is Charlotte Edwards Sir Alex Ferguson or is she Arsene Wenger? You know, which one's know. the French artiste and which one's the, the dour Scot? Perhaps we should let, <laughs> perhaps we should let our viewers comment on, on what they think about that. Um, Sid, we're just reflecting on some of the coverage that we've seen of the Women's 100. Um, and I know that you had a few thoughts on that that you wanted to share to, to wrap up this episode of the Cricket Hell Weekly. Yeah, I thought there was something really interesting about the way that we, we saw the Sky and the BBC both making their presentations. This was actually during the Eliminator, I was observing this. Um, and one thing that's, that's immediately strikes you is that Sky will do a presentation where they do their thing on the side of the field before the game, and there'll be the two people that are, you know, the talking heads, that are doing the, the Sid and Raff role, if you like. Um, and, you know, then there'll be like two, maybe three people, you know, there'll be a guy with a camera and there'll be maybe one, you know, producer or, you know, someone that's, that's doing some lighting perhaps as well, but usually not even that. So Sky, you know, have really got this down to a fine art of not needing a lot of other people. Whereas the BBC seem to need a team of 15 people in order to, to support three people on air. One of whom's entire job appeared to be to touch up Ishigura's makeup between takes. She was also doing hairspray. Okay, so I mean, you know, the hairspray is obviously you know, a, a big thing. And okay, you know, look, I don't want this to get to get out. I don't, don't want it to get you know personal with regard to Isha, Isha because you know she's fantastic and she's a she's a great presenter. We were just talking to to Susie uh, Bates, who's been working with her over the last couple of days, and she was saying you know how great Isha is and how much easier it makes her job as the sort of the, the talking head when someone as good as Isha is you know the person next to. Her. So you know, definitely not personal. But this whole thing does kind of reinforce the kind of vibe that in order, if you're a woman, in order to be on television, you have to be conventionally attractive and heterosexual presenting and, you know, wear lots of makeup and have your hair done nicely and have the kind of hair that, you know, can be done nicely. And it all feels actually that it kind of reinforces a pile of sexism within the, the kind of the broadcast industry about the fact that you know women that the women that get you know that make progress within that industry it's it's so much harder to make that progress if you are not heterosexual presenting if you are not conventionally attractive and i think that you know as as a kind of honorary feminist as i kind of like to see myself am i allowed to say that i'm an honorary feminist i think you are allowed to say you're a feminist there's no honorary about it so none of us are paid to be feminists okay so i just feel that, that makes me uncomfortable and you know i'd rather i you know i don't need to see 
Isha in that makeup, you know, she can do a great job if she had no makeup on, believe me, because we have actually seen her do it because we've seen her work on Sky where there's an awful lot less makeup and things, you know, because the, the, she does, it's not the way that Sky works. So we know that it can be done without the makeup and without the hairspray. Just let the people, let, let the women do it exactly like you let the men do it. Because there's no one there touching Kevin Peterson's makeup between every take. <laughs> there should be, he needs it. Anyway, um, I'm, it's all right, I'm already off his Christmas card list um, for saying that anything he had to say about Baz Ball was about 15 years out of date, as his opinions mostly are. Right, um, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's wrap up there. Um, thanks very much, everybody, for watching and listening as ever. Um, we've, we've loved covering the 100 again. Um, and we're back to internationals pretty soon. So see you in a week's time for more chat about England v Sri Lanka. Bye for now. Bye.